you can trike, bike. So it's in the middle of everything. Every fall, family fitness, and a bit of a concert. Your K-Life update starts now. from 8 30 to 10 children and family ministries invites the whole church to a fun fall family fitness event at cranes run nature park all ages are welcome you can walk run bike trike a 1k 5k or 10k while enjoying the beauty of fall along a beautiful paved path we'll have breakfast snack grab bag and a race medal for everyone who participates so visit us on facebook to sign up or click the link in this video's description. Finally, our Academy Band has a special concert coming up next Tuesday, November 16 at 7 p.m. Take a journey through video game history as the high school band presents Video Games Live, the concert at the school's campus. It's going to be a fun evening with some prize giveaways, so don't miss out. And that's it, church. For more community news, visit us at ketteringadventist.org community. My name is Linda, and this has been your K-Life Update. Welcome to worship. Good morning and happy Sabbath. Um, it is an honor to be welcoming you guys here this morning. Um, my name is Alden. If you guys don't know, I am currently serving here as a youth intern. And it has been a blessing uh, thus far. And so it's, uh, it's been a real joy being here. And uh, I was born into a pastor's family. And Sabbath was part of our routine. It was just part of our weekly rhythm. And there's so many things I take away from that. Um, to this day, and I learned to appreciate it more. One of my favorite things was actually my mom making enchiladas um, Friday nights. It was fantastic um, to welcome the Sabbath, and my dad would have us um, recite our Sabbath verses in Exodus. And so I actually want to know what you guys' favorite part of the Sabbath was. So I invite you guys to actually turn to your neighbor, um, tell them what is your favorite part of the Sabbath, and why is that the case? Happy Sabbath. I uh, want to welcome all those who are joining with us online this morning. We're so happy and thankful uh, that you're, you've chosen to stop by Kettering's page uh, to join in worship. We're excited. We have our kids singing uh, the opening hymn with us. We've got the choir and we've got even a brass band. And so we hope that uh, not only will the music uplift your soul, but the message as well. We're so excited to have our, uh, our previous pastor, Carl Hafner, bring the message today. So thank you for joining us. Please uh, drop a, a, a note in the chat. Uh, to communicate and connect with those in there. So have a happy Sabbath, and we hope this uh, worship service is a blessing to you. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for this beautiful Sabbath. Thank you for this community that's here. Thank you that we are able to gather here and worship you. We ask that as we carry on throughout our day that you continue to be with us and continue to show us uh, your goodness and your mercy. In your name we pray. Amen.
Now we'd like to invite all of our kids, even the ones up here and the ones in the pews, to please join us in collecting the offering for SVA Worthy Student Fund. And then you can join us on this side of our stage for our kids' life. girls. I'm Grandma Karen. I'm here to tell you a story about our roots. Trees have roots that help them grow and be strong. And we Christians, we have roots too. We learned about our roots from the Bible. Do you remember we met Father Abraham? and the centurion, and we met the early Christian in the echoing catacombs. Do you remember? We met Martin Luther and learned how God saved him from that terrible storm. And we met Martha Byington, the first Adventist teacher. And last week, do you remember who we met? Last week we met Ellen White, one of the people who started the Seventh-day Adventist Church. But what about our roots? I can tell you a little bit about that because I was there when it all started. It began with a dream, not the kind of dreams you have at night. I mean an idea that someone has when they want something to happen. When I first came to Ohio, the place where you're sitting and all these people are sitting was just a big field. We had no church to worship God in. So at that time, we met across the street at the college gymnasium. And every Sabbath, Pastor Deming would lead us in Sabbath worship. Can you imagine going to church in the gym? Well, the president at that time was Mr. Nelson, and he had a dream about building a church for all the families of the people that were part of the college and of the church and of the hospital. 
he shared that dream with Mr. Kettering. Now, Mr. Kettering knew about big dreams because Mr. Kettering's dad was a famous inventor. He invented things like the cash reg electric cash register, an electric motor for cars. And Mr. Kettering, the son, he, invent he was a dreamer too because he dreamed up the hospital that's across the street. So, when Mr. Kettering heard about Mr. Nelson's dream, he said, I've got an idea. Let, you can build the church in my field. And so the church leaders got together and they made plans for our church. And when they were planning, they said, we want a church where we can worship God. But we also want a church that can be a blessing to the community through the gift of music. And so we were all so excited. We were going to have a, a new church. So we, all the members shared their time and their talents and their offerings. And soon there were builders, carpenters, painters, bricklayers, tile layers. They all started to work and they worked so hard and we saw the church building growing right in front of us. And then in 1970, they laid the cornerstone and soon after the church was finished. We were so excited. It was like Christmas and birthdays and Thanksgiving all rolled into one. We were happy. We thanked the Lord for our, the blessing of a new church. But you know, boys and girls, when I think about our roots, I'm so glad for people who had big dreams like Mr. Nelson and Mr. Kettering. But I'm also glad for kids like you who have big dreams for the church. The church is so much more than a, a building, even though our building is pretty amazing. It's also about members like you who are a part of it. Each one of you are a part of our church. As you grow, God is going to put a dream in your heart about what he wants you to, what he wants to do through you. Don't be afraid to dream big because our God is a big God and his dreams for us are so much bigger than we could ever think of. Thank you for being a part of our church and for dreaming big for Jesus. You may go back to your seats.
Our past shapes who we are. Our culture, our values, our hopes, our mission, our identity. If we don't understand where we have come from, what has molded us, we will not only be in danger of repeating the mistakes of the past, we will be aimless in our pursuit of the future. The deeper the roots, the stronger the tree. We are Seventh-day Adventist Christians, molded by an ever-weaving tapestry through time. From the Old Testament community to the New Testament church, the beginnings of Christianity to the Reformation and the formation of our church, this is our heritage, our roots. Each has contributed to who we are and plays a part in the future that God continues to lead. And while our past enables our present, the future, that's ours to tell. We are Seventh-day Adventist Christians. Our roots continue through us. For many of you, you do not need an introduction to Carl Hafner because he was here as a lead pastor for 12 years. You've been gone for about two years. Is that right, Carl? About two, a little bit over two maybe. <clears throat> he is currently the VP of student services at Loma Linda University Health. I asked him to send me just a few things about himself, for those of you who don't know him, and I asked him for hobbies specifically, and on the top of the list, he said board games, playing board games with his family. I wanted to say, next time you're here, when you come for longer, Michael and I love board games, so you need to come over, <laughs> okay? It's a deal. He also mentioned travel, golf, and reading. Those are all great. We are so excited that you're here. I asked him to come and speak because of the topic. It is the history of the Kettering Church. And he, he's been here longer. He was part of that history. Isn't that crazy that even 10 years ago, it's part of history. And so he knows a little bit more about that. I thought he was more qualified to speak a little bit more about what it is that makes up Kettering. Thank you so much for being here with us. Let's give him a warm welcome. There is nothing better than music at the Kettering Adventist Church. Thank you, Jeremy, Brass, and Choir. And you all look younger than you did a couple years ago when I left. How do you do that? I, I am so excited uh, to be here. I could just give all of you a great big hug. Um, but you know I am German, and so that would be very awkward. My wife says, hugging me is like hugging a cactus. Uh, so I will give you a COVID, socially distant hug from me and my family. A quick update on how they're doing. Uh, our youngest daughter, Claire, is a junior at Walla Walla University. This is the kid that went to Spring Valley Academy from grade 1 to grade 12. And now she's looking to finish college. How on earth do they grow up so quickly? I do not know. Uh, and then Lindsay just celebrated her 26th birthday by running 26.2 miles in the San Diego Marathon. And she is currently the youth pastor at the Redlands Adventist Church, so nearby. And then Cherie is a teacher third and fourth grade at Loma Linda Adventist Academy. And uh, she loves the kids. She loves her job, but teaching children is beyond full time. I mean, it's really hard to stay, you know, in front of those kids. And not your kids, of course, but the kids in California. And I actually, <laughs> I, I woke up this morning thinking Pastor Clayton, and they're still a little salty that he left LAA, uh, but Pastor Clayton left the kids in California to come be with your kids here in Kettering. Uh, and so maybe that is true, that it's just the kids out there, not the kids here. 
Uh, but she is doing well and very sad that she could not join me this weekend. Uh, but thank you, Pastor Andrea. What a blessing uh, it is to be here. Uh, I consider Pastor Andrea to be my pastor uh, because you may remember shortly after we left Kettering, uh, this little thing that you might have heard of hit the world called COVID. And so we couldn't really settle into a church home there. Uh, but I just continued to worship with you through your online services. You thought you could get rid of me, but it's not that easy. Uh, and I do want to say a profound and heartfelt thank you to everybody who works with Alan Clark and his AV team. Uh, for the professional, amazing church services that they post week after week after week. I mean, you, you talk about a labor of love. And honestly, uh, it has just been a spiritual lifeline uh, to me through this whole pandemic uh, to continue worshiping with you. So to everybody who serves on the AV team, I just say, Thank you for your ministry. Um, yeah. Uh, truly, it, it has kept me connected to this church family. And so I took the 90-day challenge, as did many of you, at the beginning of the year, read through the New Living Translation, which I had never read that version of the Bible before. And then, like many of you now, during this series called Our Roots, I have been reading through the great controversy uh, once again. I've been tracking with this series that has sort of traced God's hand through the redemptive narrative, seeing God's faithfulness in the human story, stretching from the Old Testament community through the New Testament church, and then the Reformation, and last week, Pastor Andre talking about the Advent movement and how God called a people at the end of time to herald the three angels' messages of Revelation 14. And now, this series, Our Roots, it gets personal. Because now we come to here. And now, so Pastor Andrea asked me to speak about the history of the Kettering Church. And she sent me a 50-page document talking about the first 50 years of the Kettering Church. I didn't really realize, and I guess didn't really think about it, but did you know the Kettering Church was born about the same time as I was, which is to say it is a really old church, 150 charter members, dating back to the early 60s. And I, I'm wondering if maybe we would have any charter members here worshiping with us today, and if not you, maybe your parents or your grandparents or your great-grandparents were around back in the early 60s when they started the Kettering Church. I'm just curious if there's anybody in that category, and we won't judge which generation you are in, but if there's anybody in that category, I'm going to just invite you to stand, if you would. Anybody? There you go. It is true. We are here because of you and your parents and grandparents. And here we are, continuing this legacy of God's faithfulness. And so today, uh, we focus on the Kettering story. I'd like to do that by inviting you to join me in 2 Peter. Today, we're going to give a quick overview of the last epistle that Peter would write, 2 Peter, and then we will identify the three 
predominant themes of that letter, okay? Uh, Because these themes are just as relevant, just as challenging for us here today as they were back in the apostles' time. Okay, so that's our road plan ahead. Uh, And hopefully I will finish preaching at the exact same second that you and everybody in Ascent, that you are all done listening. Okay, so we'll see how this goes. Second Peter. We're in chapter 1. First, an overview. Peter tells us this, verse 12, Therefore, I will always remember you or remind you about these things, even though you already know them, and are standing firm in the truth you have been taught. And it is only right that I should keep on reminding you as long as I live. For our Lord Jesus Christ has shown me that I must soon leave this earthly life. So, I will work hard to make sure you always remember these things after I am gone. Just a quick observation or two about this. So first, Peter mentions a couple times here that he understands what season of life he is in. He knows that he is on his deathbed at the finish line of life. And so he says, I want you to remember I want to remind you about these things that are so important. I've had the sacred privilege standing next to the bed of people who know they are about to die. And it strikes me in that moment, you never hear people talking about trivial things. They're not talking about the weather, the stock market, or the Yankees. They're talking about stuff in life that really matters. So there's this weightiness, this gravity to the final letter that Peter knows. This is his final epistle, right? And so it is just so rich with meaning because he's talking about the most important things in life. And that's why he says time and again through the letter, I I just want you to remember I want to remind you, he says over and over, of these things. So what are these things that are so important? One commentary summarizes 2 Peter by saying this. 2 Peter is an intense, passionate, farewell speech addressed to the Messianic church communities. In this book, Peter challenges the followers of Jesus to continue growing in their faith, love, and service to God and be ready for Jesus' return. So central theme to 2 Peter, he's talking about being ready when Jesus comes again. And he asks us to remember three things, faith, in Jesus, hope in the second coming, and love for all people. So let's look at each one, shall we? Beginning with faith. The subtitle of these first few verses, at least in my translation, says that this is a challenge to faith. And Peter writes this, verse 3. By his divine power, God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. Your translation might say a holy life or a righteous life. Peter says, look, you have everything you need to live holy, to be righteous, so that there is no second guessing as to whether or not you are ready for the second coming of Jesus. You have everything you need to live a righteous, holy life of faith. He goes on. We have received all of this. How? How do we know that we are righteous and ready for the second coming? He says, you have received all of this by, notice this, 
coming to know him. Coming to know him. Your righteousness is not because you behave well, because you do all of these good things. Your righteousness is sure. How? Because you know Jesus. It is always, only, righteousness by faith in Jesus only. He goes on. To say, you've received this by coming to know Jesus, the one who called us to himself by means of his marvelous glory and excellence. Now, throughout this final letter, make no mistake, Peter is calling us to live a godly, holy life. He says, be holy, even as God is holy. So that's a pretty high bar. But I like the statement that T.R. Schreiner makes in his commentary on 2 Peter. He says, it would be a serious mistake to dismiss Peter's call to virtue as legalism or moralism. The exhortation to holiness is grounded in God's work of salvation as it has already been accomplished in Christ Jesus. This is not a letter calling us to legalism or moralism. You already have all the righteousness you need if you know Jesus. Peter then says, and because of his glory, and excellence. He has given us great and precious promises, verse 5, in view of all of this, and notice this phrase, make every effort to respond to God's promises. Make every effort. The Bible is not against effort, and I have said this many times from this very pulpit. The Bible does not speak against effort. The Bible speaks against trying to earn your salvation through your good works. And see, what Peter calls it, make every effort, but that effort must always be focused on getting to know Jesus. We, one year, did a 52-week sermon series, you may remember, on that one theme, knowing Jesus. Jesus, most important spiritual principle I know. And so I preach about it every sermon. <laughs> he says, make every effort, what? To respond to God's promises. Now, respond, that's an action word. See, faith acts. Faith makes effort. I'll give you a picture of this from Kettering Church history. A reading from that doc document that was sent to me dating 1968. Plans for the new church building were finalized. A drawing of the proposed edifice was on the bulletin cover every week. Eugene Kettering had agreed to give the land across the street from the hospital for a new church, but, and I never realized this before, but only after the ground was broken. He was not going to sign over any deed to this church or donate the land until he saw we were serious. We were going to respond to God's promptings, respond to God's promises to be faithful. Only when he saw us act was he going to give the land for this church. It goes on saying, a surprise 60th birthday party was given for Eugene Kettering, which strikes me as very young anymore. He was only 60 years old. Amen? Amen? At which time, George Nelson learned that Mr. Kettering had a heart condition. 
Now the urgency to start on the church became paramount in George Nelson's mind. So they quickly drew up the plans for this building. It would seat 836 worshipers, and it would be wrapped by seven classrooms. In two phases, it would be built. And then groundbreaking ceremonies were held Wednesday afternoon, March 19, 1968. And construction began on the new building 10 days later. So no sooner uh, did they have groundbreaking ceremonies, and they started construction. Eugene and Virginia Kettering decided or deeded the land for the church to the congregation at that time. Just two months later, Eugene Kettering died. Aren't you thankful? The founding members of this church not only talked about their faith, but they responded to the promptings and the promises of God. And they put a shovel in the ground. And because they did, look at the ministry of this church in this community. I had opportunity to go by Spring Valley Academy yesterday and see the building project there, and then I hear about the building project at the Good Neighbor House. Of course, I got a grand tour of the Family Ministry Center over here, and I, I tell you, I was moved to tears. As I just think about the next 50 to 100 years, think of the thousands upon thousands of life-defining moments that our children and our parents and members of this community of faith think of all of the life-defining moments that will happen in that space at Spring Valley Academy, at the Good Neighbor House. God is exploding his work and his influence in this place, but it all goes back to a small group of people who said, we are going to put a shovel in the ground. So Peter calls us to be a community of faith. The second predominant theme in Peter, this last epistle that he would write, is this idea of hope. Now remember, most of the letter is about the soon coming of Jesus. So not to get uh, tripped up by false teachers and so on, but to be faithful and not to give up hope even when people are mocking your belief in the soon coming of Jesus. Look at chapter 3, verse 3. Most importantly, Peter says, I want to remind you that in the last days, scoffers will come mocking the truth and following their own desires. They will say, what happened to the promise that Jesus is coming again? The Millerites, back in 1844, they heard that very thing. Where's your Jesus that you're waiting for? From before the times of our ancestors. So he's taking us all the way back to creation. Everything has remained the same since the world was first created. But you must not forget one thing. A day is like a thousand years to the Lord. And a thousand years is like a day. So as we think about this sweeping story, that we've been telling in this series called Our Roots, as we think about this story, that stretches from creation all the way to Kettering. The millennia to us are but a minute to God. And so Peter urges us, don't give up hope. Millions of years, it's like a minute to God. He goes on, the Lord isn't really being slow about his promise, as some people think. No, no. He's being patient for your sake. 
He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. We are looking forward to the new heavens and the new earth that he has promised, a world filled with God's righteousness. And so he calls us, hang on to hope. Don't stop hoping, Kettering Church. I remember hearing a woman make an observation at the food pantry, the good neighbor house, some years ago, and her observation still stings. She said, I have discovered in Dayton, it is so much easier to find heroin than hope. And it struck me in that moment, the whole reason God put this church here, right? To be a source of hope. And I don't know if there has ever been a time in human history where it just seems like there are so many people that are losing their grip on hope. And so God calls everybody who is a part of this community of faith to be hope peddlers. And there's a lot of research around the power of this. I think of the work of uh, Nicholas Christakis, who is a medical doctor, a PhD, a researcher, and a professor at Yale University. So the guy's got some pedigree. A pretty smart guy. He's done a lot of study around the whole idea of social stampedes. And as it turns out, the influence that we have on one another is way more pervasive than you might think. Author John Ortberg explains his theory like this. He says, it's not just that our friends affect us. Our friends, friends, friends affect us. Your friend Ted is a friend at work named Ned who has a neighbor named Fred, and Fred's negativity depresses Ned who depressed Ted. You're having a bad day all because of some guy you'll never even meet. They've discovered it's true. It's called three degrees of influence. You are impacted not just by your friends or their friends, but their friends' friends. So, if a friend of a friend of a friend stops smoking or gains weight or gets depressed, you are inclined to do the same exact thing. It's amazing, isn't it? But, of course, the positive side of this is also true. When you just speak one word of hope, when you send one encouraging note via the blue card, it not only affects the recipient of that blue card, but their friends, and their friends' friends. It's like getting a three-for-one coupon when peddling hope. It's an incredible thing. And so I thought, when I was thinking about this theme of hope, I immediately thought about the blue cards. And sure enough, it's in that 50-page historical document. Anybody want to guess what year, the first year for blue cards in the Kettering Church? Okay. How old do you think they are? Very good guess. 35 years, I heard. 37 years. Now, when we moved from Kettering, I was determined to just declutter, get rid of all the junk I didn't need. Uh, And so I got rid of over 1,500 books. I got rid of over a third of my wardrobe. I was just getting rid of everything. But you know one thing that I took with me all the way to Southern California? Blue cards that you wrote to me. Uh, And this isn't all of them. I just grabbed a stack of them. Um, Actually, this got in there. This kind of reminds me of a blue card, right? (laughs) 
So I just feel, that's why I feel the love uh, here, because you're all wearing this. And it's like you're one big breathing blue card. It's beautiful. Uh, now, I don't know how this is going to work, uh, but I thought I'd just randomly uh, choose a blue card or two. And sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, because some of you have very sloppy handwriting. Okay? <laughs> So, no offense, I love you. I read your blue card back in the day, um, but uh, let's see here. I think I can read this one. Um, this is not rehearsed. Pastor Carl, great sermon which gave me a new insight on the Bible study of the Good Samaritan. I don't think anyone fell asleep. Great. God bless. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take that. That's a pretty low standard, I admit. People stayed awake. That's good. Uh, thank you, Chris. Okay, should we do one more? Just to see? All right. And, uh, uh, yeah, see, that's, that's what I'm not going to read because that looks like a lot of, well, it's printed. Maybe I can read it. Uh, thank you for having accepted the pastoral responsibilities here at Kettering. It's great to not only enjoy and appreciate your sermons personally, but also have our son listening attentively too. He stayed awake. There's kind of a theme <laughs> <laughs> through, through, these, through these blue cards. Uh, I'm sure your injection of humor is no disincentive to his or my attention. A very small print. Back in the day, this was probably 12 years old because it was right after I came, um, or 14 years old, and my eyes were better back then. Uh, I'm also pleased that my son is having the opportunity to work with you in improv and drama. Uh, thank you also for challenging us to live out the principles that Christ taught us, uh, whether or not they come naturally or easily. Best wishes for all your endeavors. And I stayed awake during your sermon. No, I just... <laughs> he should have written that. Thank you, Brian. I think Brian's probably here. Um, maybe you remember writing the card. I don't know. But you, know, you think about it. These cards, one little... Whoa. One little seed of hope. And here I am 14 years later, and it's still just uplifting my spirits. And not just me, but now I'm telling all of you. And so it infects you, and then your friends, and your friends' friends. This is like as contagious as the Delta variant. We can start a pandemic of hope. That's why God put Kettering Church here, right? <laughs> it is such a powerful thing. And so Peter challenges us. Be a community of faith and the righteousness of Jesus and put a shovel in the ground. And be hope peddlers because in this town where God put us, it's a lot easier to find heroin than it is to find hope. And you, you can build a culture of hope. And finally, he calls us to love everyone. And this is a theme not only in 2 Peter, but in 1 Peter as well, where he challenges God's people to, to love each other deeply, he says, from the heart. And you may notice in the first chapter, he builds this long list, building one virtue upon another until he gets to the most important, which he puts at the pinnacle of the list. He says... Chapter 1, verse 5, in view of all of this, make every effort to respond to God's promises. Supplement your faith, and here comes the list. 
with a generous portion of moral excellence. And moral excellence with knowledge, and knowledge with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with, and at the top of the list, and I skipped over a lot of them, but at the very top he says, and brotherly affection with love. The most important virtue to be lived out in church life is love. That's why I finished many, many sermons here by reminding all of us to go now and live and love like Jesus. Again, it just strikes me, this is such a powerful thing, isn't it? And one of my favorite stories on this remembers the couple had been married over 60 years. But as they were aging, he knew the day was coming. The fog of dementia began to steal both her memory and her mind. And so sure enough, the day came and he had no choice but to put her in an Alzheimer's unit. But he would faithfully go and visit her every afternoon. One day, he was trying to trigger some of her memories. So he grabbed a couple pictures off the mantle and began to question her. Uh, Sweetheart, he said, "Um, do you know who this is? And he showed her the picture. Just had this blank stare. No recognition at all. This is Jacqueline, our niece. You remember Jackie, right? He grabbed another picture. Do you, do you remember who this is? Again, not a hint of recognition. But this is our son, Matthew. Remember Matthew? Then he looked her square in the eye and he said, Sweetheart, do you remember who I am? And there was this little spark. She started to slowly nod her head. Yes. Yes, she said. You're the one who loves me. Couldn't remember his name. Couldn't forget his love. No doubt, there will be many, many people who will come to this church. They won't remember your name. But they won't forget how you make them feel. They won't forget your love. So God calls the Kettering Church to be that community of faith and hope and love to transform this community until he comes. Amen. Now, I don't think there is a more fitting way to continue this Bible teaching than to celebrate together a new family joining the Kettering Adventist Church. And so we are going to celebrate together a baptism. And one of the things in the 50-page history of the church, uh, they're talking about all of the hurdles and the challenges of getting this building built. And one of them was this. Our congregation eagerly awaited the opening of this building that seemed to be plagued with all kinds of delays. Our unique 
baptistry, especially designed for our room, would not hold water long enough to heat it and perform a baptism. It had to be torn out and rebuilt. Fortunately, it has worked perfectly ever since. I did not know that about this baptistry. But I am so thankful that they rebuilt it and that it still works. Praise God. Now, as I think about my experience uh, here at Kettering, probably the most memorable moment for me, uh, when I was standing in that baptistry, and some of you may remember this, uh, with my daughter Claire. She was in high school at the time, and I had the privilege of baptizing her. It's the only time in 32 years of pastoral ministry where I lost it and I could not, could not regain my composure. And so I say you may remember it because it probably made you feel really, really awkward, uh, like me hugging you or something like that. Um, but I, I just you know, read the letter I had written to her from the Bible that I had read to her, to her when she was just a little girl. And uh, I, I, just, I just lost it. Um, but here's another thing I remember about her baptism. And this is uh, such a compliment to this congregation. We said to Claire, look, uh, we're going to invite a few of the people in the Kettering Church who had the biggest impact on your spiritual journey. And you can invite, you know, a few of those adults in the Kettering Church uh, who have had that kind of an impact on you. Uh, and she came back a day or two later with a list of over 150 names. We are so grateful for how this church just helped us to raise our two daughters and that she had that kind of affinity and affection for so many people in this church who weighed in to her spiritual journey and helped her. Uh, so a heartfelt thank you for the church that you are and for the church that God continues to call us to be. I am super excited today because I get to be here with Cameron and Syra, who are going to be getting baptized today. I met Syra first when she came to my office. It was just after I got here. And she said, I would like to study the Bible together. And she said, for me and my husband, we want to do studies together. And I said, okay. I told her I would need to order some things and then I would send it to them and then we can start over Zoom. But I wasn't really sure that this was actually going to happen. I didn't know if she was really serious about this. So then I had sent in the studies, and then I heard back from you. And it was interesting and funny because, Cameron, you had told me afterwards that you said, well, I wasn't sure about this either. It was just Syra was saying, okay, this is going to happen. So I think neither one of us thought this was going to happen, but Syra was determined. <laughs> she knew this was going to happen. And I'm so glad that that is what happened because I got to know both of you, and they're just amazing people. I want to start off first before we talk about why it is that you've chosen to get baptized. If you could just tell me a little bit about kind of where you came from, because you came from Pakistan. You've been here for a few years now, and it wasn't easy when you were in Pakistan either because of the religious persecution that was going on over there. Could Cameron, could you just tell us a little bit? Yeah, so I can start that uh, as a Christian, our life in Pakistan was not easy and we have always been discriminated and persecuted in a way that uh, we were not giving the right opportunities and uh, always having fear being Christian that uh, we have been raised in the fa Christian family so we have been told not to talk like that do not talk about religion even someone told you 
or say something about the religion don't even reply so we always have a fear in our mind and uh, in short in 2015 we started helping our community who have been persecuted in other city and we went there to help them and that was the time the problem started in our life and things reached up to that point that we don't have any other option just to leave Pakistan and we had the settled life in Pakistan and we left everything though it was very difficult to start a new life in America but we are safe here we don't feel that kind of pressure we don't feel that kind of life risk here and uh, I just want to say uh, thanks to the American government and people and the churches here who always welcome the people or the immigrants from other countries to come here and live with, with them and also giving the equal opportunities to all of us. So I just want to say thank you to all, all of you and the community. Mm. Well, thank you for sharing that. And I know you have both told me before that you got shot at yes. in, in Pakistan and then also somebody tried to kidnap your Sorry, children. And that was kind of, you said, okay, this is it, we need to come here. And I'm really glad that you have come here and that God has brought you through all of that. And now to this point where you get to say publicly, I want to live for you, Jesus, forever. So why don't we just start with Syra, if you could share with us why it is that you want to get baptized today. Actually, I want to share my personal experience like I brought up and raised up in a Muslim country but still I was like keeping my faith on all the way like till now. I get baptized when I was 18 years old but I was not aware like so much word of God but when I get it here like my I walked in here in the church and met Pastor Andrea, it was a year ago when early COVID was started and I asked her I need to study for a Bible study, me and my husband. And she take me very light and she said, okay, we can get you some stuff and get you back. And then it was take a while, she emailed my husband and then they get in track. And I was thinking it is going to be happen, like we are going to be study. And Cameron was little, okay, we can do it. <laughs> and then we started study and knowing like more word of God and thinking like like how the love of God is for the people. I learn here a lot, like how to be in a uh, word of God, like how to survive in this world and after this life, we have an other life. So taking baptism is a, I think is a way to go to God. That's so right. I love to take a baptism and get it into the new life. Mm -hmm. And I'm happy that my husband Cameron, he's also going to be get baptized. Yes. <laughs> this is something you've been waiting for for a long yes, time, right? Yes, I was waiting for a long time.